Hello, I'm Judith A. Yates, true crime author and criminologist. This is Best True Crime. Every episode, I take you on a journey to explore crime, forensics, and investigations. Today, we are going to Savannah, Georgia, to visit one of the most interesting and artistic cemeteries in the United States, Bonaventure Cemetery. It is the largest of the city's municipal cemeteries containing nearly 160 acres and located on this beautiful scenic bluff of the Wilmington River. So what is the difference between a graveyard and a cemetery? We'll discuss that later in this video. But right now, I want you to know that when you visit this cemetery, I recommend you use a tour guide. You do not want to miss the history and the stories that accompany this amazing place. The tour company I recommend is Sixth Sense World. I was lucky enough to have Don Martin as a tour guide. Don Martin is not just a tour guide, but a historian and lifelong Savannian. She can answer any questions you have, and you might even get a song or two. I sat down with Don Martin to chat about her life as a guide through the cemetery, symbolism on headstones, and much more. After my father died, it was my first experience with death. My grandparents had all died before I was born. And I didn't have cousins and aunts and uncles, so our family was our unit. My father died, uh, was buried, laid to rest the day before my 43rd birthday in January of 2006. And it was my concern as to where did he go, why is he not here. So that led me into paranormal investigations, volunteering for paranormal investigations. In 2008, I got my tour guide license, and I truly believe that my father brought me out here to be with him. I was a social worker. Also, my sister-in-law was a great inspiration. She was an executive television producer for the CBC, did a documentary about the book, Midnight of the Garden of Good and Evil. She wanted to come to Savannah and do a documentary about the true city and the story. She met my brother playing in City Market. He was a well-known blues player. They met, claimed to have fallen in love at first sight. And in 1997, he moved to Toronto. But that, this was my way of continuing my brother's legacy and Jennifer, my sister-in-law's love for this city. And the eerie fact that Jim Williams brought her here. And my brother's name is Jim Williams. <laughs> but our last name is Helverson. But still eerie coincidence. So it was my interpretation of death that led me to uh, wanting to be a tour guide. The book Dawn is referring to is the 1994 novel, Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. The statue on the cover became a symbol and a tourist attraction. When the book became a movie, the statue was featured on the poster. And the statue became known as Bird Girl. The sculpture was relocated in 1997 for display in Telfair Museums in Savannah. And in the late 2014s, the statue was moved to a dedicated space in the Gibson Center for the Arts. Before it became so famous, it had sat at Bonaventure unnoticed for about 50 years. Overhead, watching you enter, are two excellent examples of Ladies in Mourning. The Ladies in Mourning are considered to be a woman that leans over a cross or a column. It's believed that a lady in mourning is a woman whose husband died very young and made her a young widow. She would have never remarried, but would have leaned over that cross or column, the column being that her husband may have been a head of household or supported the community, the leaning over the cross, showing their belief in Christianity of the Holy Trinity of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit but their story of never remarrying and carrying that love through them until the day that they died, they mourned the rest of their life. Besides the ornate and symbolic headstones, there are life-size statues of those lost dedicated in their memory. Her name is Julie Denise Backus Smith. She was a prominent member of Savannah Society, and she even served as county commissioner. Julie fought corruption and inept leadership in her local government. She was also active in the arts, the Children's Hospital, and in the mental health care community. 
Julie was a volunteer for Chatham Savannah Citizens Advocate. Julie Denise Bacchus Smith was also the first woman from her city to compete in the Boston Marathon. She took home ribbons for multiple races all over Georgia. At one time, Julie was dubbed Savannah's fastest female runner. While she gave heartlessly to charities, her own life was suffering loss, and there are some issues that just cannot be outrun. It turned to tragedy. Divorced from her husband and two years after a marathon, Julie was 57 years old in 2003. She was sitting down to a family dinner with her parents that year. She excused herself from the table and went to the bathroom. After some time, her family went to look for her. Julie was found hanging dead by suicide in her parents' bathroom. She had left a letter. It explained she killed herself at this time and place so no one would ever suspect her ex-husband of murder. Now, Julie's exact likeness, captured in bronze forever, jogs in Bonaventure over her gravesite, a testimony to her dedication and love. Okay, now you were talking about the columns and how if they were broken on top, that was done intentionally. That's correct. A column, universal language of funeral art, represents a man who is a pillar or supporter of the community. But in certain cases, they cut and break the tops of the columns purposely. That shows a young man that was a pillar or supporter of the community, but his life was cut short. Tree trunks are also a symbol, normally done with children, that also represent their life being cut short. Johnny Mercer was a multi-hit songwriter and the founder of Capitol Records' label. There is a bench beside his grave listing his hit songs, and his immediate relatives are buried around him. Our guide was a good friend to one of these relatives, and prior to their passing, they had given her permission to share a medley of Johnny's songs while standing next to her grave. The world, that old black magic's got me in its spell. Jeepers, creepers, where'd you get those peepers? Jeepers, creepers, where'd you get those eyes? Hooray for Hollywood, that ooey gooey chewy Hollywood. You must have been a beautiful baby, you must have been a beautiful child. You got an accent. Most females weren't really recognized in the Victorian era except for their name, date of birth, and date of death being on a headstone. If it was a preacher, it might be side by side with an open book. But for women, roses would have really been the only acknowledgement of them dying while they were still beautiful, or a what we would refer to as a husband and wife deathbed that would have shown the husband and wife being buried together 
but women in the Victorian era, they didn't vote, they didn't own property, they didn't really have any rights, so there was not a lot of funeral art to dedicate to females. The oldest marked grave is at the Tattnall family at Plot E1 in the southwest corner behind where the original plantation home was built in 1750. Um, Josiah Tatnell I was the oldest marked grave. He is in the second row and at his grave there is a bronze rectangle with a hump over the top. It says revolutionary soldier. The bronze rectangle is a symbol given by the government to show him and his service during the Revolutionary War to free us from British rule in the 1770s. So Josiah Tatnell the first is the oldest marked grave. So what is the difference between a graveyard and a cemetery? Well, a graveyard is attached to a church or a place of worship, and the people buried there are usually that denomination of the church. A cemetery is a standalone area where people from all denominations, all backgrounds are buried here. So now you know. How many of you got it right? Please comment in the section below and let me know how you did. Well, unfortunately, grave robbing had been uh, a nuisance ever since they've been burying the rich with jewels. Grave robbers would originally break into a grave to rob the dead of any valuable jewelry. Families had stopped doing that, knowing their loved ones' graves were being desecrated. So... What the grave robbers had found as a solution was to pull the teeth of the rich dead people and they secretly sold them to dentists to make dentures for rich people. Instead of wooden teeth or animal teeth, it was a terrible crime to commit. The death penalty was, <laughs> as a result, if you were caught, but it definitely was more about pulling the teeth of the dead instead of finding jewelry or riches. Well, I know once upon a time they were stealing bodies out of the graves for uh, schools, for future doctors to operate on, to uh, look at, to learn about the human body. And in this situation, in this cemetery, in the Victorian era, there were so many dead poor people who didn't have burials, they didn't have family members. So as sort of a way to study the dead, they didn't desecrate the rich people and use them for those purposes. There were too many poor dead people that died at sea or died of starvation, overpopulation, debtors, prison. So there really was not a need in this period to take them to use as sort of a cadaver to teach them about human anatomy. Look closely at some of the grave sites at Bonaventure and you will see large slabs over the graves. This was to discourage grave diggers. It was a form of burglary prevention. The more difficult to break in, the less likely grave robbers would try. 
This house sits at the entrance gate at Bonadventure. The screened-in porch was used by the gravedigger slash security officer to walk about with a bird's eye view of Bonadventure. This fellow's job was to keep an eye out for the grave robbers. Today, the building is used for offices. Bonadventure has too much history and stories to put in this one visit. There are narrative chronicles for everyone. True crime, history of the Victorian era and the location, history of funeral practices. You will be fascinated, appalled, spooked, and leave educated. So this is why I recommend using a tour guide for your visit. The tour guide you need is Sixth Sense World. They are Savannah's original ghost tour company. This is not some nameless corporate entity where you are just a number on a page. This is 100% local and women owned. They care about their guests. And your best tour guide is Dawn Martin. Be sure to request Dawn for any tour and be sure to check out her YouTube page. While visiting Sixth Sense, you have to see their gift shop. I love skeleton decor and there are plenty of them all over the place, as well as oddities, keepsakes, original art, hats, oh my gosh, the hats. You just have to see it. So when you visit Sixth Sense and go on a tour, be sure to check out their gift shop. If you or someone you know is contemplating suicide, or having suicidal ideations, please seek help. The National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is a United States-based suicide prevention network of over 160 crisis centers. They provide 24-7 service via a toll-free hotline, 1-800-273-8255. It is available to anyone in suicidal crisis or emotional distress. Please get help. Thank you for joining me on this episode of Best True Crime. I'm Judith A. Yates and I hope you subscribe. Be sure to visit truecrimebook.net and be safe out there.